Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this Biologus event, Following Christ in Pandemic Times. My name is Deborah Harsma, and I am president of Biologus. Joining me tonight will be best-selling author Philip Yancey, physician scientist Julia Watacero, and Christian relief leader Carol Bremer Bennett. Now, these are incredibly stressful, stressful times for all of us, individually and as a nation. Deaths from COVID-19 have now surpassed a mind-numbing 200,000, and the polarization dividing our country has reached to epic proportions. Tonight's event is designed to refocus our minds and hearts on following Christ in the midst of it all. Now, we all know it's election season, so I just want to remind us that as Christians, our allegiance is to Jesus Christ first before any political party or candidate. Both parties include faithful Christians and neither party has a monopoly on all that Christ calls us to. So what we wanna to do tonight is focus on the vision that Christ has given us. Christ calls us to love God, to love our neighbors, even when they disagree with us, to proclaim the truth, to make disciples of all peoples, to fight for justice, to value the sanctity of every human life, especially the least of these, to care for the most vulnerable, the old, the young, the poor, the oppressed, the sick. That's the church's calling. And at Biologos, we believe science and medicine are equipping the church to live out that calling in 2020. So unfortunately, during the pandemic, the word science has become polarized. It's seen by many as a hoax or as a way to advance a political agenda. But for us at Biologos, that's not what science is about. We see science as a reliable tool for learning about God's world and how the human body works. To us, science makes us think of physicians and researchers and relief workers, many of them believers who are working hard to serve others, to treat patients, to find a safe and effective vaccine, to get information and resources to those who need it. Science and medicine are gifts from God. But for all science can do, we also always remember that it is our faith, not science, that meets our deepest needs. It's our trust in God that overcomes fear, gives us peace, motivates our action, and brings ultimate hope. So both science and faith, not at odds, but working hand in hand. And that's what we do at Biologos. We bring you reliable science within a Christian worldview. On our website, we address COVID and many other topics, featuring believing scientists and physicians sharing their expertise, reflections from theologians and pastors, and stories of Christians from all walks of life who found how science deepens their faith. And we have some of those voices here tonight. So let me introduce our panel and then we'll bring them on. So uh, we have first Philip Yancey, best-selling Christian author. Uh, Philip's books have been key in my own spiritual development, uh, from reading Fearfully and Wonderfully Made and Where's God When It Hurts to The Jesus I Never Knew. Many of his books explore the healing work of modern medicine. His writing is informed by his own early church experiences and his interactions with Christians from around the world, including Dr. Paul Brand, who worked on the front lines of leprosy in India. We also have Carol Bremer Bennett, who is the U.S. Executive Director of World Renew. She oversees relief work in 30 countries around the globe, alleviating, alleviating poverty and hunger and responding to disasters. She is born of the Navajo Nation and her organization, World Renew, uh, in addition to serving around the world, serves right here in the U.S. in many places, as, including the Navajo Nation, one of the groups hardest hit by the pandemic. Finally, we are joined by Dr. Julia Watichero. She's a physician and scientist at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York City. Her expertise is in liver disease and liver transplants. And as a Christian, she looks for ways to bring her faith into her work with uh, other physicians and with patients. Last spring, she helped on the front lines of the COVID outbreak in New York City. Note that our panelists are speaking for themselves tonight, not for their institutions, um, but we're so eager to hear their experiences and views. We are grateful to the David and Carol Van Andel Family Foundations for sponsoring tonight's event. And now let's get to the conversation. We asked, we've asked Philip Yancey to lead it today, and let's bring on our panel. Here Great. we all are. 
Thank you, Deb. There are very few events that would affect just about the whole world, but the pandemic we're in the middle of is one of those. And I'm sure we all have people who either had COVID or we know people who are related to people who had COVID and we're all vulnerable and we're all changing our lifestyle because of it. But I'd like to start at first, and this would be mostly for you, Julia. We don't really have a picture of what it was like on the front lines. I've, I've talked to some doctors and nurses who talk about how uncomfortable this PPE equipment it is, the, the goggles fog up and the masks kind of wear creases in your face. And here you were uh, in a laboratory, quite comfortably doing your research, and suddenly you're called in the middle of the front lines. What was that like just on a physical basis for you? Yeah, uh, let me take a step back and say, um, before we get to the physical aspect of things, things were um, psychologically, we were being warned. Um, we were seeing what's going on in Lombardy um, in Italy, and we were anticipating um, many of the physical challenges. But the, the truth is, so I'm a transplant hepatologist. We're very clinical. Um, we're in every ICU. We do procedures. We're very used to wearing PPE for all of our day-to-day -day patients in the hospital. Um, they're post-transplant, many of them. So that's not a huge burden or an overwhelming challenge to us. The fear around not having enough, you know, not having, um, uh, going from single use to, you know, weeks on end. Um, and that sense of uncertainty was something that was a little bit new for us. But um, the physical aspects, you know, most clinicians are not used to thinking about themselves. So, um, you know, when your glasses fog up, when you're, when you're a little bit concerned that your mask might not have a tight seal, that's one little episode. Um, when... uh, April 6th, um, BioLogos live stream, um, this community was praying, and that's when I had been redeployed um, as an ICU phys uh, triage person. So usually when a patient enters the emergency room, there's two different dispositions, home or admission to the hospital. And when you get admitted to the hospital, you either go to the floor or the ICU. And so I was put in charge um, to help out um, our critical care um, staff overnight with triaging patients that became too unstable for the floor and then needed a unit. And what we were experiencing in New York at that time, especially in our hospital, was that every single square inch was turned into an ICU. Um, I think we had mm -hmm. one non-COVID unit, but operating rooms were turned into ICU. Everything was turned into an ICU. And so finding a bed, all of those things became a large scale, very coordinated um, effort. We're very used to chaos. We are very used to patients becoming unstable and getting them to the right level of care. Um, two things that I had never seen before and I had done disaster management post hurricane in Houston and some work abroad um, in West Africa. Um, and two things that were eerie um, that none of us had experienced before is the volume and influx of death that we had seen was mm -hmm. coupled with silence. Like usually hospitals, there's chaos, there's families crying, there's, there's, you know, when someone moves from that stable level of care to an unstable level of care, a massive amount of people show up to put lines in, to intubate, you know, your teams, there's a coordinated effort. And the teams that I was running um, and overseeing were, you know, we stopped at the door. One or two people were allowed into that room. We were very um, um, conscious of how much we limited contact to the bare minimum to avoid unnecessary exposures, but also save lives. So that, mm -hmm. but the, the hallways were eerily silent um, because we were all, you know, besides um, taking care of those arresting patients, there was no traffic. You know, we were on minimal amounts of tests, the bear um, conserving in conservation mode. And when a patient needed something, um, a nurse would go in um, and, and the hallways were largely occupied by very well uh, uh, attired um, nurses. And so that was, that was one aspect. The other aspect that I'd never been part of before is the amount of names that I recognized on sign out lists, colleagues. Mm. I've, I've never had that many people that I know, and there's just something very different. We like to think that we're fair, but there's it slices your heart in a different way when the cardiologist you always call is in a bed 
um, needing care, and they might be the one that, that you lose or resuscitate or have to make those tough decisions on. Yeah. So, so um, I know I took uh, liberties with your physicality question, but it's it was incredibly difficult to separate the physical from the emotional. I think most integrated physicians don't do that well. Um, we yeah. numb to get us through moments. You know, it was very easy for me. I'll give you a, a story of one of the arrests. Um, so when we say arrest, that's code. That's when you hear like the code blue. So a patient is declaring, <laughs> I am the most important patient in the hospital right now. I am trying to leave this earth. And all of us are trying to stop that from happening. Um, and when um, I remember thinking, so it was the first 26 minutes, I think I had done an interview about this. In the first 26 minutes where we're just trying to hand off shift change, um, there were three rapid responses. So that's people whose vital signs are telling you they're probably in the wrong level of care and need to make it to an ICU. Two arrests, so two code blue type patients. So you have to deploy your resources and separate them. And, and one death. And that rapidity is not something that's sustainable through the course of several hours. And I remember, you know, we make rather complicated decisions in transplant about life and death and survival and mortality and assimilate lots of objective data. And my hardworking residents were reading me data and quoting me, you know, what the patient history was and helping me make an, a, a, a choice um, about what to do uh, in terms of medications and overseeing that arrest. And they, by and large, let it 100%. But I remember the cry of my heart saying, Lord, there's another one to go to. I need a pulse back in five minutes. We have to move. We cannot keep resuscitating this person. So if you want them to live, I need you to, to make that clear to me with their body right now because we cannot do what we ordinarily do. There's just not enough of us. This is not sustainable. Um, and I just remember having that input of, of real time. We will do everything that we can, but based on what I know about the humans that I'm in charge of and I have to make decisions, that's the role that I have. I really need you to feed me spiritually. And in this case, in this particular case, we did get a pulse back. That person was transferred to a different level of care. But I remember thinking, it's, a, it's, it's minutes, you know, like I'm holding God uh, by the hand and grasping him and saying, I need you to, to, to give me answers now, now um, to make things clear. Because I can't go home and think about this, even though I did. I don't want these poor young doctors who are doing this over and over again, sustained trauma that we all saw. I don't want them to carry this like I did after disaster management. So it's real time, just really imploring God be present. There's so much we don't know. Um, and right. I think that was probably one of my first or second shifts. So it's a very long answer to your question, but there was very much a heart on its knees um, throughout those silent hallways, littered with prayers. And I know I wasn't the only one. Yeah. Julia, last week I interviewed a chaplain here in Denver, and she works in a memory care facility, pretty large, 128 beds. And in two and a half weeks, they lost 22 patients and two staff people. And these were people who were already confused. They didn't know, why can't my family come to see me? I, and many of them were dying, 22 of them did die. And usually they died alone or with the chaplain or maybe one other person with them. And she described what it was like to try to share those moments by holding up an iPad wrapped in plastic, you know, Zoom calling to the family who was in the lobby just down the hallway, but they couldn't come in to the people and right. how hungry they were for human touch. In fact, she said it got so to be a problem mm -hmm. because they took away their couches. Normally they were sitting together and being with each other and they took them away as a safety precaution and they found them uh, going from one bed to the other. That's not what they had in mind, but it was just a symbol of the hunger and the confusion, especially toward the end of life for people who were having mental issues and dementia. And Carol, uh, I know your situation is very different. You're not a physician, but you're head of an organization that works with what I have heard is, is the most devastated community in the United States, percentage-wise, the number of people who have been affected. And I remember seeing a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times where it said that, uh, that it was the highest healthcare, highest rate of COVID anywhere. In fact, they said that there are places in the Navajo and and uh, other Native American tribes that 
where the life expectancy is less than in Cambodia, in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And you, I know, have talked about it, it's not just the physical, it's not just the mental, it's the whole behavioral thing, the way it works out in alcoholism and abuse. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear what that's like on the front lines from the areas you've been involved in. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Toglini, Basischin. Uh, those are my Navajo clans, uh, the bitter water people and the water flows together people. So I greet you today from the lands, actually not of the Navajo, of the Diné people, but I'm here in Michigan um, at, on the lands of the Ottawa and the Pretoria people. And so I thank them for their stewardship of this land, especially on Indigenous Peoples Day today. And so, yeah, to watch um, from what I have, what I do at World Renew, which is responding to disasters around the world, but also in North America, usually the crises and disasters that we respond to are um, either a man-made conflict or um, natural disasters. And so this was uh, a bit of both, really. Um, and to watch my own people, the Navajo, um, be hit so hard was quite, um, quite challenging and devastating to me, first of all, to be far away, uh, but also just to see how all of the factors uh, made for a per perfect storm for the Navajo Nation. And um, I, early on, kind of um, checked myself and decided, you know, this was my Esther moment to stand up and um, to use the resources and the uh, donors and, and so forth of World Renew to make a difference for the Navajo people and the Zuni people too in the Southwest. And the the culture of the of the native people in, in uh, on the Navajo Nation, you know, it's very communal and with high poverty and far distances, shared transportation, um, shared housing, intergenerational living, um, all of those things make for a uh, a place where a virus can spread in a household quickly. And then when you add on to the top of that, um, the, um, the infrastructure and lack of infrastructures, still today, up to 30% of Navajos on the Navajo Nation do not have running water. And indoor plumbing is something that is, is not equally distributed. Uh, in our country, um, and it certainly is a sign of injustice and, and system, systemic racism, as many people of color are the ones who do not have running water or electricity. And, you know, and then you add on to that years of um, oppression and hardship and living in poverty, you get a lot of underlying health conditions as well. Um, when you have a people who have lived in poverty for a long time, have gone through generational trauma, you will have people who have diabetes and are obese and have um, alcohol and other addictions. And then, you know, there's some environmental racism actually that goes along with that because there's mining that happens that's not done safely and not cleaned up well when there's accidents. And so there's higher rates of cancer. So all of those things just really made um, an environment where the virus could spread rapidly. And then you don't have the hospitals as well and the lack of ventilators in ICU. When Julie was talking about the PPE and the fear of not having enough, certainly um, in the Navajo Nation, that became a reality very quickly. And even when PPE was um, designated to come and funds were designated to come, it took weeks, even months for that to actually get to the right places and to get that supply chain going. So it was quite devastating and people were figuring out how to sew gowns out of, you know, the operating sheets. They were trying to figure out how to sew gowns out of Tyvek material from Home Depot. It was, it was a lot of creativity and innovation, but it was definitely a survival mode. Yeah. Well, we talked about the physical and the mental, psychological, and Julia, you mentioned the spiritual times when you're just crying out in prayer. I wonder about the people that you deal with, either as a physician or Carol, in your case, uh, among the, the groups you were with. Was it a spiritual, spiritual issue? How did you handle questions like, uh, is God trying to judge us? What's going on? Uh, what can we expect from God? some of those spiritual questions that inevitably come up, how did you handle them? 
Carol, do you want to go first? Or sure, I can. Um, everything yeah. in the Navajo world is spiritual. And so that's mm -hmm. very much like being a Christian, where we don't uh, pull our spirituality out of one part of our life. And so your health and your well-being, your relationships, everything is spiritual. Um, so it's very much a part. Um, and, and this is true in other places where World Renew works as well, that the spiritual and the physical are, are very um, close together. However, sometimes the church comes in and tries to teach people that God only cares about the spiritual side of you. And actually World Renew as an organization works quite hard to tell people, you know, the truth is, is that God created all of you holistically and he cares about every part of you, your health and your nutrition, your spiritual life, your family life, your education, all of that is a gift from God and it needs to be nurtured and, and great potential there. And so we work quite a bit in truth-centered transformation to try to, um, to help people with that. And so um, in Malawi is one place where we're working right now to um, help prevent COVID. And in a community in Malawi, um, young girls who were surveyed responded that they were taught that the way you get COVID is because it's a curse from God. And so, mm -hmm. you know, then what do you do to prevent that? You know, it, it could be a bit fatalistic that you can't prevent it or you just try to be good. Um, and so that's where we need to come in and make sure that the science is there as Christians. We can embrace that and that we can really teach what what the real causes of, of a disease are so that there can be true prevention of it. For the Navajo, certainly the spiritual side was, was there. And I think the hardest part was to see the loss of community and that, that silence that Julia spoke about. And, you know, like you said, Philip, with the iPads and saying goodbye to loved ones, that is just not how you do that in an indigenous community. Right. And so that right. was very difficult. Yeah. I, I sometimes wish that people in the church would take some version of the Hippocratic Earth Oath. Um, first, do no harm. <laughs> because when uh, a disaster happens, often we jump in with quick judgments of a uh, God punishing or God judging or whatever. And mm -hmm. and also there's a lot of talk about God's will. You know, what is God's will? I almost have stopped talking about God's will. And I talk about God's desire. And I can talk very confidently about God's desire because we as Christians believe that God came to earth and showed us God's desire. Wherever Jesus went, he, he came with comfort and healing. Never lectures, never scolding, never philosophies, but with comfort and healing. And I, I wish the church would follow that. Deb, I'd, I'd like to move to a new area, and that's with you, because you're kind of in the center of a lot of controversy and between science and faith, and the COVID crisis has, has been part of that, because we've got some people saying, uh, you got to have faith, not fear, and, and some Christians who are leading anti-masking crusades and others who are suing so that they can break the rules of, the, of their state and have larger church services than are being allowed. So tell us a little bit about like what it's been like for you being in the middle of all of that. Well, at Biologos, we are working to bring together rigorous science and biblical faith. That's always been our mission. And so when the pandemic started, we um, did events with Francis Collins. We brought in several um, experts to speak on our podcast and our website. And it's, um, you know, I wish some of the people you refer to, the, and, and we, I think we all know them. There's people who are saying, oh, the pandemic, it's just a hoax. It's not a real thing. It's just, a, uh, um, it's just been invented to hurt the president or something. And I wish they could just hear the stories we just heard from Julia and from Carol. Like they have seen it firsthand and the suffering is just heartbreaking. Um, I kind of knew both of their stories, but just hearing them tell it again, I'm like, whoa. It's, um, it's, it's sad that these things have happened and there's a lot to lament and mourn. I think, you know, to answer one of the questions you raised, faith, not fear. I think for some people think, well, we should just pray and God will heal us. But that's not recognizing that God has already given us this very worthwhile gift of science and medicine and good information. And we should be good stewards of that. That's a gift that can be used to um, bring healing in our lives. And that's really a direct gift from God. It's not contrary to God. So it's one of the ways God answers our prayers. 
Now you published, Biologos published a statement on some of these issues. Could you just describe in a few words what that statement hoped to accomplish? Yeah, um, so we managed to get 7,000 people to sign the statement and including wow. dozens of top Christian leaders um, from who are scientists, theologians, um, many different areas. And the statement uh, was saying, you know, we come from different political parties, different um, Christian denominations, but we want to come together to say we uphold the authority of God's word and we respect what science is telling us about God's world. And we want to follow the advice of public health experts and do things like wear masks, get vaccinated when a safe and vac effective vaccine is available, combat misinformation, um, pray faithfully, and fight for justice for all people, especially those who've been hardest hit. Hmm. And I'm going to give you a chance for a little plug here because you haven't mentioned it, I don't think, but one of the the, the founder of Biologos was Francis yeah. Collins, whose name you mentioned. And he is the top doc, actually, in the United States, his PhD and MD, and heads up the National Institutes of Health. And mm -hmm. when you see these pictures in the, in the newspapers, magazines, and on television of people frantically trying to come up with valid treatments and and Good vaccine. Most of them are working for Francis Collins. He's got 20,000 employees. <laughs> and one of them is Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's on the news almost every night. Mm -hmm. Francis had a great uh, award just uh, in the last few days, yes. the Templeton Prize. And uh, I'm just going to give you a chance to, to repeat kind of Francis Collins' vision for the organization of Biologos, which is what we're part of right now. Yeah. So um, Francis was so well-deserving of that award, given his scientific stature mm. and the way he has been so open about his faith and um, the way he brings them together. And you can tell he's driven by his faith in just the 100-hour weeks he's putting in to bring about a safe and effective vaccine for all of us. Um, he's a great example of somebody who sees his work as continuing the healing ministry of Jesus and of serving others. And I would love for... Um, all Christians just have in their mind a picture of the Christian physician, people like Julia, people like Francis, who are just working and serving um, so hard, so sacrificially. And to so when they think of science, to think of those people and not think of, oh, there's some atheist out there or that's just some liberal agenda. Yeah. No, these are yeah. people who are really working to serve. And Julia and Carol, being more on the front lines, of course, uh, Deb, you are because everybody sends you emails, but uh, not so much day to day. And uh, have you had any experiences with people who were from a religious basis, very skeptical of science or even anti-science? And through your conversation, through your work, they've you've kind of converted them into a way that looks at it a little differently. Have you had experiences like that? Um, I'll start. So by and large, the patients who come to seek my care, um, let me give you a little bit, zoom out a little bit. Half of what I do is clinical. Every academic physician spends their time between doing research, doing clinical care, and also education. Um, when a patient comes to me, there's, there's a whole range of liver diseases they may have. Part of the hat that I wear is figuring out where in the chronicity of their disease they are and trying to prevent it from getting worse. So they never need the transplant resource that I have. So a lot of the things that contribute to chronic liver disease are behavioral. And so many patients are resistant to the idea of taking medicines. Um, and I may be joining them in the earlier phase. If there are certain things that we can do from a lifestyle modification perspective, we want to leverage that. But if their disease is at such a stage, or we've tried through every mechanism, through multidisciplinary care, and they're still progressing, it's not blaming someone for their state of disease, but it's using other tools that we have. All of that builds a lot of trust during the time, just figuring out why a patient might be resistant to the idea of it, and then also leveraging uh, relationally. You know, this is the time to, to deploy this type of medication or this type of treatment or this type of surgery or this type of strategy. Um, along the lines, um, people will tell you what their resistances are um, once they feel safe enough to disclose those types of things. 
I have to say a lot of the people that are very resistant to, to care, period, don't show up in our clinic or may, you know, meet us end stage um, refusing blood products and needing a transplant. And we have to make decisions very, very quickly with those people. But I think having a spiritual background and having a, a religious upbringing, I can say, you know, God's helping me steward my brain and my skills in order to help get you better. God's using me to help you. And he's using all of these people, whether they're believers or not, to help you too. It's, it's how he restores and redeems broken things in this world. He uses people. Um, and I think when you when you speak to people at their level and understand where they're coming from and where those resistances are coming from, a lot of that gets untangled. Um, that's time that it takes on a one-off sort of basis. It's like um, asking patients where they get their sources of information from. That's one of the last five minutes that I spend with my patients is kind of an ask me anything or what are you seeing? It educates me about where they're getting their sources of information from and how to help teach them where to get their sources of information from. So the, it's a labor of love. It takes a lot of time. I think with the accelerated um, aspects of the pandemic, we need large scale public health messaging that's very, very consistent. That's very, very simple. When people are scared, they need to be at the third, fifth grade level. And so we just need very simple messages, um, how to assimilate certain data, jingles that they can sing while they wash their hands or put on their mask or things like that. Because that's really, you know, six months of living through this and also just framing expectations. How long can we expect this? When will we get new news? You know, one of the most becoming things I think of Francis, every humble scientist, every humble pastor, every humble person is that you acknowledge when you made things, when, when you made a mistake or, you know, if your hypothesis is wrong, it's a very shared skill set between spiritually oriented people and scientists is we're venturing based on this supposition using everything that God has given us um, as a resource. And when we learn better, we can reframe that. And that's just sort of the cauldron of repentance that leads to change. And I use language like that sometimes with um, if they're a religious patient, sometimes if they don't have a spiritual background, I, you know, I just ask them, what's gotten you through hard times in the past? No human has made it, you know, very far without some degree of suffering. So we leverage what resources they've had in the past, and then we build new ones. And, and it's, it's one of the beauties of taking care of people longitudinally is you become part of their family. They care for me as much as I care for them. Um, they're as excited when I see them on a telehealth visit as I am to see them. You know, there's, there's hard evidence that you're doing okay. I can see your face and you're not sick. Um, and that's, that's the aspect that just brings joy to a lot of us that practice clinical medicine. And it brings us great grief when we do everything possible and we can't, we can't change the outcome. Hmm. And Carol, I think you mentioned the phrase systemic racism earlier this evening. And mm -hmm. uh, I know both you and Julia represent uh, people of color who are disproportionately affected by the pandemic in the United States, for sure. And she's described some behavioral choices that people make, uh, eating too much, drinking too much, you know, those things that can certainly affect liver diseases. And I've heard some people of color say, there you go again, blaming us for the epidemic, for, for that disproportion. So in what degree is it systemic racism? Yeah, you know, it's built into it's built into the system and what we need to realize. You know, I've heard people say, well, the system is broken. And I think we have to recognize that the system wasn't built correctly in the first place. And that's a result of sin and what people can actually build. And so we need to recognize that in that humility that Julia was talking about, that we need to continue to work to restore and reconcile and reclaim because um, we haven't built it correctly. It, in the United States, as we sit here today on Indigenous Peoples Day, we recognize that um, there was greed and there was selfishness and there was a pushing aside of God's beloved people and not recognizing even the image of God in every person. And so as those systems were built, they were built to serve some people and to oppress other people. And so we, we still see that today, and that's caused generational trauma. 
And so that in itself is something that World Renew works on in around the world, but also here in the United States to address the traumas that are there. Because we can't be healthy people. We can't be reborn and, and renewed creatures um, as God wants us to until we can come through our trauma knowing that it's okay to have gone through those great sorrows and losses and to know that God cries with us, to be able to lament that, but to bring it to the cross and to become reborn and to become a reconciled person. Um, and so, and then to work for justice. That's a lot of what World Renew recognizes is that the poverty, the hunger, the, the illness is there a lot of times because of injustices. And so we need to look, work at those root causes. For the Navajo people, um, you know, there has been um, trauma of being displaced off the land and we've had to go through what we call the long walk, which was very much like the Cherokee Trail of Tears um, and the lives lost and what you were given to eat there altered genetics possibly forever in the Navajo people. And, um, and then you add into that, um, not being able to own your own land and to have the dignity and make a livelihood there's so much hopelessness. And it, like I said, it does result in um, behaviors that can be um, cyclically self-destructive. And um, the circle is such a strong image in Native um, philosophy and in Christian philosophy, too, as God calls us to turn and repent and turn back to him. Um, but when those circles are caught in addictions, we need to work to, to break through those things. Um, the Navajo Nation is a food desert. You've heard about, talk about food deserts. The Navajo Nation is about the size of West Virginia and the state of West Virginia. And there are only 13 full service grocery stores on the entire nation. And so people are driving one, two, two and a half hours to get to a grocery store. That caused problems when there were shortages of things and you were trying to not have people be together and there's only a couple of vehicles and so the whole family is packing in a car. Um, that caused another way that the virus spread, but th there are things that we need to do um, because there is definitely the results of systemic racism. Yeah. And Julia, I know you've been quite concerned with racial justice also. Do you want to contribute something to this discussion? Yeah, I think it's one of the elements when you asked about the spiritual aspects of things. And um, I know a lot of the circles that I'm part of, we all felt very strongly, you know, without going into too much detail, one of the questions that I ask whenever I am faced with a situation I've never encountered before is, where's the Holy Spirit's been at work all this time? Where, what points can I join in on that? And from a prayer perspective, I think many of us felt somewhere around the time of Pentecost, you know, there was just a critical mass of what was developing. Um, you know, inside the hospital, there were tensions, people were stressed, emotional fatigue was starting to, to you know, bear itself. When I, you know, I, I was on the night ICU triage and everyone I saw was a woman or person of color that was working. And the messaging coming out he didn't seem to address some of the aches and pains of being the labor force um, that was doing some of the heavy lifting. Um, and when George Floyd died, um, that was filled with raw emotion in so many ways. It was an opportunity to cry cathartically, um, but it was an opportunity. I mean, people have been talking about these things forever. There was an aspect to which it was like how Psalm 42, how long, oh Lord, how long are people going to know this problem exists and do nothing about it? I was, I was very filled with grief um, because n we knew about racial disparities. There are publications being churned out. You know, we're actively making choices in terms of the priorities that we have in terms of whether or not we're going to choose to address them. And I when you're emotionally fatigued, I wondered, you know, are people going to exert the heavy lifting that it's going to take to reallocate major resources to try to right some of these wrongs when our incentive system is very different, our commercial system is very different, and it's been exposed in, in every industry. You know, there is an, I, I use the phrase apocalyptic when I was talking to a pediatric geneticist that I do some research with, because outside in New York in April and May, it was like beautiful 
absolutely beautiful. The sun was shining, you know, the birds were singing. And in the hospital, it was mad chaos and death and disease and destruction like we had never seen before. Um, and it was just this weird uh, dichotomy between inside and outside. And I felt that internally too, that sort of volatility of spiritual angst, knowing that God is sovereign, knowing that the Holy Spirit's at work, but really not trusting my fellow human being to do the right thing, you know, really not trusting us to make the right decisions because the data has been there for a really long time and we've willfully been neglecting it. But it was also, you know, an opportunity to know the most powerful tool that I know for change um, is prayer and to have direct access um, to the God of the universe who will respond, who sometimes withholds his response until we ask. Then I just began to pray kingdom sort of prayers. Lord, I can't fix this problem. You're illuminating criminal justice problems, healthcare problems, education issues. Things are being born that we should never unsee. We don't want to go back to normal. You know, there's an acknowledgement that certain people have been aware of certain things at a certain time. Certain people are waking up. How do we bring people together to fight this common sense of injustice everywhere? But the, the, the racial wounds, the generational trauma, the grief that many of my black and brown fellow employees were expressing and that we were feeling was an opportunity to pray. Um, so, so many of us actually, I saw more people connecting over prayer some of whom I knew were believers, some of whom I didn't know, um, just began to pray like we had never prayed before. Um, at work, around work, yeah, you know, on Zoom, whatever it took. So there was a, a deep sense of coming together in a very scary, uncertain time, um, but leaning on the anchors that we knew we, we had, but being okay, holding space with one another, you know, with whatever emotion was emanating. So. So uh, along the lines of, of racial injustice, statistically, you know, what we were seeing in New York is, is it's widely published, but, you know, to have on the phone a, a colleague or a friend whose father's African-American and has every single risk factor and statistically knowing that the outcome is not going to be good for that person, yet wanting to pray something different and wanting to change that and feeling at times helpless in the ability to change it as a human, as a doctor. Um, but also very hopeful that the God of the universe heard me, heard us, heard collective cries. Um, but it's, it's tough territory. It's spiritually yeah. angsty territory to be in um, when because we don't deny reality. The evidence around us is there. Death is undeniable. Um, your sense of helplessness in that, your physical, mental, spiritual, every type of exhaustion is very real. And then it can feel like a platitude, like those out of touch people yeah. that Carol was mentioning. Um, when, when the practical aspects of, are not met and you just really, really have to lean hard. Um, and I, I just cry out to God a lot. Um, and, and implore us to do so more corporately um, so that because people do have that sense of a spiritual cauldron being being filled um, when there is corporate collective um, worship and prayer, this absent physical touch. You know, my, one of my biggest yeah. questions I had going into my first shift, I'm, I'm the type that sits on the bed with the patient. Um, I always like to be eye level and sometimes my teams, you know, we roll in like 16 or 18 people thick and when you're gowned and, you know, we're obviously not doing that in the middle of a pandemic, we're going in as few as possible. But when I lose my team, that makes me sad. I like being able to have a social worker to hand off things to or, a, you know, pharmacist to check me on, you know, certain things right in front of the patient. And one of my first thoughts when I went to go see a patient that I had formed a bond with, um, as an inpatient is, I, how close can I get? I really want to get closer. I want to sit down and talk to him like we always do and just navigating that. How much personal risk am I going to take? Because I really want to connect with him. He's sad. He's never been hospitalized this long before. This may be the last time, and he, it wasn't even a COVID admission. Um, this may be the last time that we ever get to see each other. Um, that, was, that was hard. And he was a person of color. So that's yeah. partly why I wanted so badly to connect with him. Yeah. Well, I'm watching the clock out of the corner of my computer here. And 
we have a lot of ground to cover, and I'm going to speed things up by uh, doing a little fact checking. We do that on the news and or after presidential debates or whatever, you have these fact checkers. So I'm going to throw out some questions, and I want some really short uh, answers for things that really deserve long answers. And I'll just see what we come up with. We realize we're not epidemiologists, we're not virologists, but you guys are working with it on a daily basis, so you, you know more than most of us. First one, I was very surprised last night. I was watching 60 Minutes. Leslie Stahl was interviewing a number of physicians who were intimately involved with the COVID-19 crisis. And she said, if you had a choice between a mask and a proven vaccine for the coronavirus, which would you choose? Every one of them chose a mask. Mask. What would you choose and why? <laughs> I, I, I'll start. Um, I would also okay. choose a mask um, because it's been shown to be so effective in the airborne transmission of of the virus. Um, mm. And we don't know enough um, about how long sustained, you know, antibody responses, et cetera. All of that will be tested. Um, but a mask is simple. It's safe. It's effective. Um, it's quick. Uh, I don't worry about an adverse reaction to it. Um, and some of the other hesitations that come about, even though they're minuscule in terms of overall risk, um, it's very practical. It's something that is deployable, um, assuming, you know, that, that there's a supply of masks. I would, I would also very much um, support mask wearing um, as my primary line of defense. I would add, just add how accessible, how okay. accessible they are yeah. to everybody around the world, you know, Correct. and the vaccine is going to take a while. And so let's wear those masks. And I should explain that we're all, we're not wearing masks because we're alone in either our homes or a hotel room or whatever. And properly socially distance if there's anybody else in the room. So Philip, if I can uh, add one, one comment too. Sure. Um, is a lot of the questions that get asked sometimes or a lot of the ways that we frame things sort of inappropriately from the very beginning have been either or, you know, it's it's uh -huh. either this or that. Part of being a Christian is navigating this path of like going through hard things um, and, and, and the purpose of potentially wearing a mask until we get to the time that there's rapidly scalable vaccines. Um, I just want to always sort of bring Christians back to the both and you know, we, we have the capacity to hold things in tension um, and and go through hard things. So not to change your question, I would still choose a mask, but I would do okay. both when they're available. <laughs> Why not? Why not? OK, got, next yes. one. I saw a, a survey of 400. Well, it was actually a statement of 400 Belton physicians who are making the case, we've really overblown this. It's not that different than flu. I mean, these are physicians, they're not politicians, they're just, they're doctors. Uh, from what you've seen, Deb, you, you live with this, you see the, the statistics coming in, you, you know how hard Francis Collins is working. Carol, you've seen it on the reservation. How do you respond to somebody who says, well, look, there are a bunch of doctors who says it's no more serious than the flu. Why should we be all that? Concern. Why should we shut down the economy for something like that? Well, there are places that didn't shut down the economy and uh, the virus still impacted the economy a lot. So that's also one of those. It's not an either or kind of question. I think what you have to do in science is look at the consensus of many scientists. You can always find a few detractors on any of the contentious issues out there. but. Scientists are trained to build this consensus. And um, if you have an unusual idea, you're rewarded for that if it turns out to be right. But if it's, if it's not, you know, the consensus, it's, and it's because it brings together people of many different perspectives. And they're all cross-checking their work. And there's professional rewards, you know, if you catch somebody else and um, we're, we're trained to accept correction. And so looking at the broad consensus is really a good way to go because it's our best human way of understanding what's really going on. Not because it's some group thing, but because it's exactly to oppose um, individual bias by bringing so many people together. So I would say these these Belgian doctors are in a very small minority on that one. Okay, good. What about uh, this 
question about whether asymptomatic people, people who show no symptoms, are capable of spreading the virus. Has that been clearly determined? Julia? Yes. Uh, I think yes. that's been shown based on the outbreaks that we're seeing. Um, testing strategies may differ uh, across the world and definitely state to state, but asymptomatic transmission is is sort of nailed shut, I think, at this point. Okay. One interesting thing that's been happening on the Navajo Nation is that the, the cases of who is getting COVID is actually much higher in the younger people. Um, of course, the oh. death rate in, is lower, but who's getting it is quite high. Uh, uh, and higher than the elderly people. Interesting. And one last uh, quick question, and that is what about reinfection? I know there was quite a controversy about that. Can people who've had the virus and maybe had some antibodies against it, are they susceptible to reinfection at a later time? Has that been established? I think we're seeing cases, you know, the earlier cases that came out of China. I know there are some cases that are now being described in the United States. Um, so is the issue of reinfection possible? Yes. I think we're starting to see it at the case reportable level. Um, the mechanisms and the disease severity, I think that's in the unknown category, um, whether or not someone has, uh, remains asymptomatic, but does get reinfected with the virus versus has an expression of the disease at the tissue level, et cetera. Um, but is reinfection possible? I think there's, there's evidence, there's emerging evidence that that's, that that's true. Yes. And I did see a blog by Francis Collins in the National Institutes of Health the other day saying, although we don't have much evidence yet on, on COVID-19, there are other coronaviruses closely related to it where there are clear cases of reinfection. So it's, he's assuming that it does occur. Well, we, we are running out of time. And uh, I would like to mention one kind of cautionary tale that involves a lot of what we've been talking about, and it's a, about a different disease, polio. There was a, there's only been one disease that's been completely eradicated, and that's smallpox. And the second one was supposed to be polio, and they came very close. They were down to about five countries, and then a few countries resisted. Nigeria was one. Right after 9-11, uh, they became suspicious about Westerners coming in, saying, we'd like to give you some shots or some pills. You know, they didn't they, they just suspected our motives. And so one governor in particular said, nobody in my, in my province is going to have any of that vaccine. And instead of five countries, it gradually spread to about 20 countries through transmission and travel. And the uh, UN figure to cost additional $500 million. There are only two countries left now. Nigeria has come around. It was just declared polio free a couple of weeks ago, Pakistan and Afghanistan are the two countries that are resisting, often for religious reasons. And in fact, in both of those countries, health workers have been killed for going around giving a polio vaccine. This is a personal thing for me because my father contracted polio. I was only one year old. This was in 1950, about 50,000 people a year were getting polio in the United States. And it was especially cruel disease because it it affected children, many of whom would be paralyzed for the rest of their lives. And it was in the news every day, the, the death tolls, the pictures of the iron lungs with these little children's faces sticking out of one end of the iron lungs. Well, the people who were close to my father thought, what? how could it possibly be God's will for a 23-year-old man who was planning to be a missionary to die or to be paralyzed for the rest of his life? So against doctor's advice, these people who care for him and loved him, encouraged him to leave that iron lung and enter a chiropractic hospital away from the apparatus he needed to help him breathe. And a few days later, he died. And I've lived my entire life under the impact of that error in theology. It wasn't that they didn't care. It wasn't that they wanted him to suffer. It's that they thought, we know better than science in this case. We know better than the doctors. Our religion is more important than what we're hearing from the experts. And that's a cautionary tale that we need to be very careful. We need to be slow as Christians to make judgments, do no harm. Uh, the, the mission we have is very clear. Paul sets it out in 2 Corinthians 1. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, 
and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. The God of, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. I wish that the world around us would see that God through the way we act in the middle of a crisis like this. Thank you for being with us tonight. Mm -hmm. And we're all on the front lines in one way because this is a pandemic that affects everybody in the world. No one is exempt as we've seen from some of the world's leaders. And Deb, I wonder if you would be willing to close our session here in prayer tonight. Definitely. That's such a wise word to end on that we um, are called to have compassion and I hope the church is known for that. So will you all join me in prayer? Oh Lord, you have been our dwelling place through all generations. Our hope and our strength is found only in you. And yet, where our hearts are lamenting how much has been lost already in this pandemic. And we bring to you in prayer, as we've already said, we know that you are powerful and you are loving and that you hear our prayers. And so we pray. We pray for those who are sick right now, that the treatments that have been developed will be effective in them. We pray for the healthcare workers who have suffered trauma on the front lines of uh, mental and physical and spiritual and how um, draining that is. And we pray for healing and uh, mind and heart for them. We pray for those who don't have access to water and to good food and the resources that they need, um, equal access to healthcare and move our hearts to uh, fight for justice to not set it aside, but to always remember those who have been oppressed, often by our own communities, and to work for justice for them. We pray for wisdom for decision makers at all, all levels of our government, of our schools and churches and businesses and communities. May we come together around this disease to care for the most vulnerable, May, oh Lord, please work so that our fears do not overwhelm us, but that our compassion, the compassion you call us to, will be most dominant in our minds and that we will do all we can to care for others, even if it means wearing a, an annoying mask, because we know it will protect not only ourselves, but the people around us. I pray that you'll bless uh, Julia and her work as a physician and scientist. Bless Carol and all the relief work going on. Bless all those in the Navajo Nation and provide for them. Help us to provide. Bless Philip in his writing and uh, continue to use all that he's written to draw people to yourself. Lord, hear our prayers. In your mercy, please meet our needs through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank all of you. Thank you to our panelists. Um, uh, it's just been great talking with you. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your wisdom with us. I'm so glad people could hear you today. I want to thank it's again our event. Yeah, sure. It's been good. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to thank our event sponsor, the David and Carol Van Andel uh, Foundation for uh, supporting this event this evening. And I wanna thank everyone for listening. So watch uh, of the social media and the website for the recording of this event and share it with everyone you know. Blessings to all of you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone.